Chapter Fourteen of Murder Madness by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Paula remained in the room with Bell for perhaps twenty minutes, and Bell had the feeling of eyes upon them and of ears listening to their every word. In their first embrace, in fact, he murmured a warning in her ear, and she gasped a little whispered word of comprehension. But it was at least a relief to be sure that she was alive and yet unharmed. Francia had been in error when he told Bell of Paula's delivery to the Brazilian to be enslaved or killed as Ribiera found most amusing. Or perhaps, of course, Francia had merely wanted to cause Bell all possible discomfort. It was clear, however, blessedly clear and evident, that Paula's pallor was due to nothing more than terror a terror which was now redoubled because Bell was in the master's toils with her. Forgetting his warning, she whispered to him desperately that he must try to escape, somehow, before the master's poison was administered to him. Outside, he might do something to release her. Here a prisoner, he was helpless. Bell soothed her, not daring either to confess the plan he had formed of a feigned submission in order to wreck revenge, or to offer encouragement because of the message knotted in the piece of string by Jameson. And because of that caution, she came to look at him with a queer doubt, and presently with a terrible, quiet grief. Charles, you, you have been poisoned like the rest. The feeling of watching eyes and listening ears was strong. Bell had a part to play, and the necessity for playing that part was the greater, because now he was forced to hope. He hesitated, torn between the need to play his role for the invisible eavesdroppers and the desire to spare Paula. Her hand closed convulsively upon his. Very well, Charles, she said quietly, though her lips quivered. If, if you are going to serve the master, I will serve him too, if he will let me stay always near you. But if he will not, then I can always die. Bell groaned, and the door opened silently, and there were men standing without. An emotionless voice said, Senorita, the Senor Ortiz will interview the Senor Bell. I'm coming, said Paula quietly. She went, walking steadily. Two men detached themselves from the group about the door and followed her. The others waited for Bell, and Bell clenched his hands and squared his shoulders, and marched grimly with them. Again long passages, descending to what must have been a good deal below the surface of the earth, and then a massive door was opened and light shone through, and Bell found himself standing on a rug of the thickest possible pile in a room of quite barbaric luxury, and facing a desk from which a young man was rising to greet him. This young man was no older than Bell himself, and he greeted Bell in a manner in which mockery was entirely absent, but in which defiance was peculiarly strong. A bulky, round-shouldered figure wrote laboriously at a smaller desk to one side. Senor Bell, said the young man bitterly, I do not ask you to shake hands with me. I am Julio Ortiz, the son of the man you befriended upon the steamer Amarente Gomez. I am also, by the command of the master, your jailer. Will you be seated? Bell's eyes flickered. The older Ortiz had died by his own hand. In the first stages of the murder madness, the master's poison produced. He had died gladly, and in Bell's view, very gallantly, and yet his son. But, of course, the master's deputies made a point of enslaving whole families when it was at all possible. It gave a stronger hold upon each member. "'I beg of you,' said young Ortiz bitterly, "'to accept my invitation. "'I wish to offer you a much-qualified friendship, "'which I expect you to refuse.' Bell sat down and crossed his knees. He lit a cigarette thoughtfully, thinking swiftly. "'I remember and admired your father,' he said slowly. "'I think that any man who died as bravely as he did "'is to be envied.' 
The younger Ortiz had reseated himself as Bell sat down, and now he fingered nervously, wretchedly, the objects on his desk. A penholder broke between his fingers, and he flung it irritably into the wastebasket. "'You understand,' he said harshly, "'the obligations upon me. I am the subject of the master. You will realize that, if you desire to escape, I cannot permit it. But you did my father a very great kindness. Much of it I was able to discover from persons on the boat, more from the wireless operator, who is also the subject of the master. You were not acting, senor, as a secret service operative in your attempt to help my father. You bore yourself as a very honorable gentleman. I wish to thank you. I imagine, said Bell dryly, that anyone would have done what I did. He seemed to be quite at ease, but he was very tense indeed. The bulky, round-shouldered figure at the other desk was writing busily with a very scratchy pen. It was an abominable pen. Its sputtering was loud enough to be noticeable under any circumstances. But Bell was unusually alert just now, and suddenly he added still more dryly, Helping a man in trouble is quite natural. One always gets it back. It's a sort of dealing with the future in which there is a profit on every trade. He put the slightest emphasis on the last word and waited, looking at young Ortiz, but listening with all his soul to the scratching of the pen. And that scratching sound ceased abruptly. The pen seemed to write smoothly all of an instant. Bell drew a deep breath of satisfaction. In the trade, when in doubt, one should use the word trade in one's first remark to the other man. Then the other man will ask your trade, and you reply impossibly. It is then up to the other man to speak frankly first. But circumstances alter even recognition signs. Ortiz had not noticed any byplay, of course. It would have been rather extraordinary if he had. A pen that scratches so that the sound is Morse code for Bell, play up, J, is just unlikely to avoid all notice. Ortiz drummed upon the desk. Now, senor, what can I do that will serve you? I cannot release you, you know that. I am not the deputy here. There has been a setback to the master's plans, and all the deputies are called to his retreat to receive instructions and to discuss. I have merely been ordered to carry out the deputy's routine labors until he returns. However, I will be obeyed in any matter. I can and will do anything that will make you more comfortable or will amuse you, from a change in your accommodations to providing you with companions. You observe, he added, with exquisite bitterness, that the limit of my capacity to prove my friendship is to offer my services as a pander. Bell gazed at the tip of his cigarette, letting his eyes wander about the room for an instant and permitting them to rest for the fraction of a second upon the round-shouldered writing form by the side wall. I am sufficiently amused, he said mildly. I asked to be sent to the master. He intends to make me an offer, I understand, or he did. He may have changed his mind, but I am curious. Your father told me a certain thing that seemed to indicate he did not enjoy the service of the master. Your tone is quite loyal but unhappy. Why do you serve him? Aside, of course, from the fact of having been poisoned by his deputy. Internally, Bell was damning Jameson feverishly. If he was to play up to Ortiz, why didn't Jameson give him some sign of how he was to do it. Some tip. Here, Veenkind, said Ortiz wearily, perhaps you can explain. The round-shouldered figure swung about and bowed profoundly to Bell. Dersenio Ortiz, he said gutterly, and in a sepulchral profundity, he does not understand himself. I have never said it before, but he serves the master because he despairs and he will cease to serve the master when he has hopes. And I, I serve the master because I hope, and I will cease to serve him when I despair. 
Ortiz looked curiously and almost suspiciously at the Germanic figure, which regarded him soberly through thick spectacles. It is not customary, Herr Wiedkind, he said slowly, to speak of ceasing to serve the master. It is not customary to speak of many necessary things, said the round-shouldered figure dryly. Of our religion, for example. Of the woman we love. Of our conscience. Of various necessary biological functions. But in the presence of the young man, who is the enemy of their master, we can speak freely, you and I who serve him. We know that maybe the deputies serve because they enjoy it, but their subjects, they serve because they fear, and fear is intolerable. A man who is afraid is in an unstable condition. Sooner or later, he's going to stop fearing because he gets used to it. When the master will have no more hold on him, or else he is going to stop fearing because he will kill himself. To an outsider, the spectacle of the three men in their talk would have been very odd indeed. Two men who served the master, and one who had been his only annoying opponent, talking of the service of the master quite amicably and without marked disagreement. Ortiz stirred and drummed nervously on the desk. The round-shouldered figure put the tips of its fingers together. How did you know, demanded Ortiz suddenly, that I serve because I despair? Bell watched keenly. He had began to see where the talk was trending, and waited alertly for the moment for him to speak. This was a battlefield, this too luxurious room in which young Ortiz seemed an alien. Rhetoric was the weapon which now would serve the best. Let us talk frankly, said the placid German voice. You and I, Senor Ortiz, have worked together. You are not a devil like most of the deputies, and I do not regret having been sent to help you. And I am not a scoundrel like most of those who help the deputies. So you have liked me a little. Let us talk frankly. I was trapped. I am a capable secretary. I speak several languages. I have no particular ambitions or any loyalties. I am useful, so I was trapped. But you, Senor Ortiz, you are different. Ortiz smiled bitterly. It is a saying in Brazil, if I recall the words, A calda do domino e de rendis. The devil's tail is made of lace. That is the story. Bell said quietly, No. Ortiz stared at him. He was very pale. And suddenly he laughed without any amusement whatever. True, said Ortiz. He smiled in the same bitterness. I had forgotten. I am a slave, and here Vidkind is a slave, and you, Senor Bell, are the enemy of our master. But I had forgotten that we are gentlemen. In the service of the master, one does forget that there are gentlemen. He laughed again and lighted a cigarette with hands that shook a little. I love the girl, he said in cynical amusement. It is peculiar that one should love any woman, senors. Or do you, Senor Bell, find it natural? I love this girl. It pleased my father. She was of a family fully equal to my own. Their wealth, their position, their traditions were quite equal, and it was a most suitable match. Most remarkable of all, I loved her as one commonly loves only when no such considerations exist. It is amusing to me now to think how deeply and how truly and how terribly I loved her. Young Ortiz's pallor deepened as he smiled at them. His eyes, so dark as to be almost black, looked at them from a smiling mask of whiteness. There was no flaw anywhere, a romance of the most romantic. My father, very happy, her family, most satisfied and pleased, and I walked upon air. And then my father suddenly departed for the United States, quite without warning. He left a memorandum for me, saying that it was a matter of government, a secret matter. He would explain upon his return. I did not worry. I haunted the house of my fiancée. The habits of her family are of the most liberal. I saw her daily, almost hourly, 
and my infatuation grew. And suddenly I grew irritable and saw red spots before my eyes. Her father took me to task about my nervousness. He led me kindly to a man of high position, who poured out for me a little potion, and within an hour all my terrible unease had vanished. And then they told me of the master, of the poison I had been given in the house of my fiancée herself. They informed me that if I served the master, I would be provided with the antidote which would keep me sane. I raged, and then the father of my fiancée told me that he and all his family served the master, that the girl I loved herself owed him allegiance, and while I would possibly have defied them and death itself, the thought of that girl not daring to wed me because of the poison in her veins, I saw then that she was in terror. I imagined the two of us comforting each other beneath the shadow of the most horrible of fates. Ortiz was silent for what seemed to be a long time, smiling mirthlessly at nothing. When his lips parted, it was to laugh, a horribly discordant laughter. I agreed, he said in ghastly amusement. For the sake of my loved one, I agreed to serve the master, that I might comfort her. And plans for our wedding, which had been often and inexplicably delayed, were set in train at once. And the deputy of the master entertained me often. I plied him with drink, striving to learn all that I could, hoping against hope that there would be some way of befooling him and securing the antidote without the poison. And at last, when very drunken, he laughed at me for my intention of marriage. He advised me tipsily to serve the master zealously and receive promotion in his service. Then he told me amusedly I would not care for marriage. My fiancé would be at my disposal without such formalities. In fact, while I stood rigid with horror, he sent a command for her to attend him immediately. He commanded me to go to an apartment in his dwelling, and soon, within minutes, it seemed, the girl I loved came there to me. Bell did not move. This was no moment to interrupt. Ortiz's fixed and cynical smile wavered and vanished. His voice was harsh. She was at my disposal, as an act of drunken friendship, by the deputy of the master. She confessed to me, weeping, that she had been at the disposal of the deputy himself, or of any other person he cared to divert or amuse. Oh, Dios! Ortiz stopped short and said, in forced calmness, That also was the night that my father died. Silence fell. Bell sat very still. The Teutonic figure spoke quietly after the clock had ticked for what seemed an interminable period. You didn't know, then, that your father's death was arranged? Ortiz turned stiffly to look at him. Here, said the placid voice, quite sympathetic, look at these. A hand extended a thick envelope. Ortiz took it, staring with wide, distended eyes. The round-shouldered figure stood up and seemed to shake itself. The stoop of its shoulders straightened out. One of the seeming pudgy hands reached up and removed the thick spectacles. A bushy gray eyebrow peeled off. A straggly beard was removed. The other eyebrow. Jameson nodded briefly to Bell and turned to watch Ortiz. And Ortiz was reading the contents of the envelope. His hands began to shake violently. He rested them on the desktop so that he could continue to read. When he looked up, his eyes were flaming. The real Hervid kind, said Jameson dryly, came up from Punta Arenas with special instructions from the master. You have talent, Senor Ortiz, which the master wishes to use. Also, you have considerable wealth and the prestige of an honorable family, but you were afflicted with ideas of honor and decency, which are disadvantageous in the deputies of the masters. The real Hervid kind had remarkable gifts in eradicating those ideas. Jameson sat down and crossed his knees carefully. 
I looked you up because I knew the master had killed your father, he added mildly, and I thought you'd either be hunting the master or he'd be hunting you. My name's Jameson. I killed the real Veedkind and took his identification papers. He was a singularly unpleasant beast. His idea of pleasure made him seem a fatherly sort of person, very much like my makeup. He was constantly petting children and appeared very benign. I am very, very glad that I killed him. Ortiz tore at his collar suddenly. He seemed to be choking. This, this says, it is the master's handwriting, and I know it, and it says... It says, Jameson observed calmly, that since your father killed the previous deputy in an attempt to save you from the master's poison, that you are to be prepared for the work your father had been assigned. Herr Veedkind is given special orders about your, uh, moral education. In passing, I might say, that your father was sent to the United States because it was known he killed the previous deputy. He told Bell he'd done that killing, and he was allowed to grow horribly nervous on his return. He was permitted to see red spots, because he was officially, even as far as you were concerned, to commit suicide. It was intended that his nervousness was to be noticed, and a plane tried to deliver a message to him. Your father thought the parcel contained the antidote to the poison that was driving him mad. Actually, it was very conventional prussic acid. Your father would have drunk it and dropped dead, a suicide, after a conspicuous period of nervousness and worry. Bell felt his cigarette burning his fingers. He had sat rigid until the thing burned short. He crushed out the coal, looking at Ortiz. And Ortiz seemed to gasp for breath. But with an almost superhuman effort, he calmed himself outwardly. I think, he said with some difficulty, that I should thank you. I do. But I do not think that you told me all of this without some motive. I abandoned the service of the Master. But what is that you wish me to do? You know, of course, that I can order both of you killed. Bell put down the stub of his cigarette very carefully. The only thing you can do, he said quietly, is to die. True, said Ortiz with a ghastly smile, but I would like my death to perform some service. The Master has no enemies save you two and those of us who die on becoming his enemies. I would like in dying to do him some harm. I will promise, said Jameson grimly, to see that the Master dies himself if you will have Bell and myself put in a plane with fuel for Punta Arenas and a reasonable supply of weapons. I include the Senorita Canaleas as a matter of course. Ortiz looked from one to the other, and suddenly he smiled once more. It was queer, that smile. It was not quite mirthless. You are right just now, he observed calmly. When has the Herr Veedkind, you said, that I would quit the service of the Master, when I cease to despair? I begin to have hopes. You two men have done the impossible. You have fought the Master, and you have learned many of his secrets, and you have corrupted a man to treason when treason means suicide. Perhaps, senors, you will continue to achieve the impossible and assassinate the master. He stood up, and though deathly pale, continued to smile. I suggest, senor, that you resume your complexion, and you, senor Bell, you will be returned to your confinement. I will make the necessarily elaborate arrangements for my death. Bell rose. He liked this young man, he said quietly. You said just now you wouldn't ask me to shake hands. May I ask you? He added almost apologetically, as Ortiz's fingers closed upon his. You see, when your father died, I thought that I would be very glad if I felt that I would die as well. But I think, he smiled wryly, I think I'll have two examples to think of when my time comes. In the morning a bulky, round-shouldered figure entered the room in which Bell was confined. "'You will follow me,' said a harsh voice. Bell shrugged. 
He was marched down long passageways and many steps. He came out into the courtyard where the glistening black car with the blank windows waited. At an imperious gesture, he got in and sat down with every appearance of composure, as of a man resignedly submitting to force he cannot resist. The thick spectacles of the hair-bead kind regarded him with a goggle-like effect. There was a long pause, then the sound of footsteps. Paula appeared deathly pale. She was ushered into the vehicle, and only Bell's swift gesture of a finger to his lips checked her cry of relief. Voices outside, the guttural Spanish of the hair vid kind, other emotionless voices replying. The hair vid kind climbed heavily into the car and sat down, producing a huge revolver which he bore steadily upon Bell. The door closed, and he made a swift gesture of caution. It may be, said the Germanic voice harshly, that you and the young lady have much to say to each other, but it can wait, and I warn you, mine hair, that at the first movement I shall fire. Bell relaxed. There was the purring of the motor. The car moved off. Obviously, there was some microphone attachment inside the tonneau, which carried every word within the locked vehicle to the ears of the two men upon the chauffeur's seat. An excellent idea for protection against treachery. Bell smiled and moved so that his lips were a bare half-inch from Paula's ears. Try to weep loudly, he said in the faintest of whispers. This man is a friend. But Paula could only stare at the bulky figure sitting opposite until he suddenly removed the spectacles and smiled dryly and then reached in his pockets and handed Bell two automatic pistols and extended a tiny but very wicked weapon to Paula. He motioned to her to conceal it. Jameson, moving to make the minimum of noise, handed Bell a sheet of stiff cardboard. It passed into Bell's fingers without a rustle. He showed it silently to Paula. We were overheard last night by someone. We don't know who or how much he heard. Dick the phone in the room we talked in. Can't find out who it was or what action was taken. We may be riding into a trap now. Ortiz has disappeared. He may be dead. We can only wait and see. The car was moving, as in city traffic. A swift dash forward, and a sudden stop, and then another swift dash. But the walls within were padded, so that no sound came from without, save the faint vibration of the motor, and now and then the distinct flexing of a spring. Then the car turned a corner. It went more rapidly. It turned another corner and another. In the light of the bright dome light, Bell saw beads of sweat coming out on Jameson's face. He did not dare to speak, but he formed words with his lips. He's turning wrong. This isn't the way to the field. Bell's jaws clenched. He took out his two automatics and looked at them carefully, and then, much too short a time, for the departure for the flying field to have reached, the car was checked. It went over rough cobblestones, and Bell himself knew well that there had been no cobbled roadway between the flying field and his prison, and then the car went up a sort of ramp, a fairly steep incline, which by the feel of the motor was taken in low, and on for a short distance more. Then the car stopped, and the motor was cut off. Keys rattled in the lock outside. The door opened. The blunt barrel of an automatic pistol peered in. End of Chapter 14